Hello, today I'm going to be talking about the game Revolt on Antares from TSR 1981. It's an interesting game. I've been looking forward to trying this one for a while. It's kind of hard to find out there, so I was happy to get a copy. So it's one of their kind of pocket games. It comes in this. The, the book itself is like, uh, you know, four inches by seven inches, so it's pretty small, but it goes in this container. It's like this plastic container. You got your dice up here. Definitely old school dice. The numbers aren't colored in. So so what's interesting about it is it's there's a lot, it seems to be a lot in this package. You have asymmetric forces. You have uh, different combinations of alliances. And a very simple combat system. Actually, there's not a combat results table. It's just you know rules on the the dice and differences and stuff. So, and um, a lot of the combat is based on the different abilities of the different characters, which are discussed in the rules. The cover and map and colors are uh, a lit, a bit loud as far as colors, but it definitely gets across the theme of you know, science fiction, maybe a, a hint of maybe fantasy, but it's primarily science fiction. Seems like a, you know, Saturday morning entry of, um, if you'd seen like cartoons, yeah. definitely evokes the theme. A little more in the back. Interiors 9 boils with unrest and intrigue. This planet called Hermos, by its people, has long been ruled by the Imperial Terran Empire. Although Lok Par is held by seven large family clans, the seven houses of Hermos. All important matters are decided by the Empire. Again, the Terran Empire. Now, however, the people of Hermos want more freedom, and plots are being laid to rise up and throw off all Terran rule. So the Terran Emperor, Empire is waning, apparently. Rolled on, on Terry's minigame has three different scenarios. In the basic game, the rebel player leads his or her aliens revolt against the Terran forces in the houses that remain loyal. In the second game, the Terran player tries to defend Ermos against revolting houses in league with invading aliens, the Serlaka. In the third game, Terran is neutral, while up to four players try to create the most powerful house on Ermos. It's a minigame by Tom Mulvey from 1981 in TSR. A more theme. Hermos, ninth planet of the star Antares, lies on the edge of Earth's Imperial Terran Empire. As the Empire grows weaker, Hermos boils with unrest and intrigue. The seven local ruling families, or houses, fight for power. Some want the Terrans to leave, others need Imperial support. A few know of the Serulaka, an alien race that is waiting to invade. In three different scenarios, a player can be a household leader, the Imperial Terran Council, the Terran player, or the leader of the Serlaka aliens. Players recruit galactic heroes, raise armies, and use their hereditary psychic powers and ancient alien artifacts to gain control of Ormos and Terry Stein. So, very interesting theme. The components, the rule book, which is 16 pages. We'll go over that in detail. And the dice. As far as counters, it's actually got a pretty good mix. There's like, you know, 70 or 80 total counters. Here's the total counters. And these are the unique ones. The majority are unique, so I'll, I'll focus on those. So going through the unique counters here. First of all, so the, the seven houses and the Terrans have, and the aliens, have different type of vehicles and they're the designators there's two numbers one is the attack strength which is on the left and then the other is the movement it's some of the houses and Terrans have all the units and some have only some of them but the units are power infantry jump troops 
laser tanks, hovercraft, and the Terrans have air jet squadrons. So hover tanks can cross land or heat CXs freely and end movement on any hex. Hovercraft may also be placed with up to two additional counters. All these counters may then move at the hovercraft's movement rates, basically carrying them. However, a counter may not move with the hovercraft and on its own in the same turn. Hovercraft must pay the rough train cost. So they can transport units. And then jump troops and air jet squadrons. Jump troops and air jet squadrons do not suffer train penalties. They may also move through hexes containing enemy counters. These units can move across neutral hexes and all sea hexes as long as they do not end their movement there. And then the others, infantry and laser tank are you know, ground units. So the different houses, there's seven different houses. House Orsini's purple, House McKenzie light blue, House Knrabe light green, House Fitzgerald red, House Sassidi orange, House Braganza dark green, and House Edistin yellow. So they have their different you know mixes of units and then they each have a leader and the leaders the leaders each have distinctive psychic powers. So again reading from the rules. Messalini or Sini has the power of fascination. In combat, there's a fifty percent chance she can face one enemy. She can force one enemy troop counter, not a leader or hero of her choice, and Jason Hex to fight on her side that turn. Roll a die, one of three means success, four of six means failure, nothing happens. Black Dougal McKenzie has teleportation power. He can teleport anyone McKenzie counter, including his own counter, but no allies or mercenaries, to any chosen hex, and occupied by many enemy counters. Each turn in the McKenzie player's movement. Barracudo Kinrabe has the power to cause hallucinations. If the stack he is with loses a battle, roll die. Roll of one to three means that the enemy attacked an illusion and Kinrib stack is unhurt. Roll four to six. The stack suffers losses normally. Simon Fitzgerald can create ion waves. They soothe the fears and raise the spirits of all troops. The stack with the him. Raising each counter is common factor by plus one. His combat value already includes that. And each of these leaders has a combat movement value. Arden Sassidi has long distance telepathy when rolling for recruiting galactic heroes. He's successful on a roll of one to two instead of just one. We'll get to that in a little bit. Catherine the Mad Braganza can summon lightning. The lightning strikes for six combat factors that are added to any. One attack her stick is making. Fortunately, her control of lightning is not as exact. A die must be rolled. On roll of 1 to 4, lightning strikes the enemy target. But on roll of 5 to 6, lightning strikes her stack instead, causing it to su subtract 6 combat factors from, from the deck. And then Nurub Khan Edistin has precognition. When his stack is in combat, he rolls 2 dice instead of 1. And the best of the two rolls is used. This bonus does not apply to leader combat. And then of the nine houses, there's Salaka invaders, which are aliens that are going to be invading in some of the scenarios. There's he's Magran the Invincible. He's the alien leader. And he's commander of a 7-4 laser tank corps. That's why it's 7-4. And he's got power infantry and jump troops. Marhos, he's the one of the natives on the planet. All the other houses are basically humans that settled there in the past, but these are the original natives. So Marhos is the popular leader of the original primitive alien inhabitants of Amaros. Each native counter attacked with him gains plus one bonus to its combat factor due to high morale. 
And then Ward Serpentine. These are represent the Terran Imperial units. Ward Serpentine is consul for Imperial Terra and Ermos. And Terry's nine and commander of the Berserkers of the Imperial Guard, a six three power infantry battalion. So that's his group. And those are the units he has. And there's various galactic heroes and we'll and you randomly get some of those during the game. And again, these are attack and movement. Andros, Android of Unknown Alien Manufacturer. Andros can summon and command the Phantom Regiment, 5 5 Corps of Other Dimensional Warriors, which move across terrain like the Dimensional Plane, which we'll talk about. Corvus Andromeda, Intergalactic Assassin. He's a bonus of plus one to the die roll for leader combat only. Dr. Death, an outlaw who creates zombie like troops from the dead. He can take immediate control of any two troop counters that die in a battle he is in, be they friendly or enemy troops. No replacement points need to be paid for these counters, and they must always remain stacked with Dr. Death. If Dr. Death is killed or wounded, the zombie counters are removed from play, as if destroyed, and can be replaced normally by the original owner. Emerald Ardani, commander of the Emerald Company, a mercenary 7 4 laser tank formation. The Iron General, cyborg commander of a mercenary 7 to attack 7, cap movement 4, laser tank battalion. There is Starfire, intergalactic adventurous, and pilot of a 510 airjet squadron. Null space, the Null Space Kid, youthful intergalactic adventurer, and pilot of a 510 Urgent Squadron. Skarm 3, Alien Mercenary Captain of a 4-5 Jump Troop. Subadai O'Reilly, Commander of O'Reilly's Raiders. A 6-3 Power Infantry, Infantry Battalion. And then Tovan, Polycor, Polycor, Intergalactic Smuggler and Weapons Runner. The player who recruits Tovan receives an additional two replacement points immediately to resent Represent the cargo Tovan ship. These points are not lost, even if Tovan becomes a casualty. And these purple are alien artifacts. The Devastator destroys life, destroys all life not protected by force shields in a one hex radius. Can be used only once per game during the combat phase of the unarmed player, and is left on the board to mark the devastated area. Leaders in the area are rolled for as if they had lost in leader combat. Neither side receives victory points for, for economic hexes that have been de devastated, nor can any counter move over th or through the devastated area. The devastator and the field generator will cancel each other out if used against each other. Both artifacts will be destroyed without the loss of any of the counters. Dimensional plane, the dimensional plane adds plus two to the movement factor of all counters stacked with it and allows travel through the rough terrain without penalty. Counters stacked with it may move at C or end their movement in an all C hex. Energy, dra <clears throat> Energy Drainer drains power from attacking forces. All counters attacking the att stack contain this artifact. Attack with a strength of plus two combat factors each, regardless of the type of counter. This artifact can only be used when defending. It has no bonus if attacking. It does not affect penalties or bonuses due to leaders' psychic powers. Field Generator can be used either to cancel a fortress to cancel a fortress force field or to create a force shield that acts like a fortress. The field generator can only be used for one function per turn. It may not be used both to attack fortress and to create a force shield on the same turn. The field generator cannot create a force shield in a fortress hex. The force cannon is an artillery counter with a combat factor of 8 and movement factor of 1. Can move through rough ground, mount mount desert jungle at one hex per turn, so quicker than other units. Let's move cost than other units. Sonic Imploder is an artillery counter with a combat factor of seven and a movement factor of two. The UFO is an alien flying craft which acts as a 510 air jet squadron. Look at the map then. So it's not a very large map, but it's got a lot of a lot going on here. It's a turn record track, of course. The Blues Ocean. 
the different colors represent the territory that various forces own. So the Imperial owns this, the brown. And the other colors are the colors of the territories of the different houses that match. Like Fitzgerald would be red, for instance. And then the various, obviously it's a hex map, so it's smooth that way. Various train indicators. These are mountains, jungle, desert, and then economic, triangles are iron, minerals, coal, seaport, grain, textiles, fish, electricity, industry, gold, oil, and cattle. And then you see various various forts going through the rules. It's three three scenarios. One of them is the basic game, Revolt Against Terra. The scenario is a two player game. One player is the house leader who starts to revolt. The other part is the Imperial Terran Council. The great counters are not used and the rebel player chooses which house he or she will take. How to win? At the end of 10 turns, the player with the greatest number of victory points wins the game. Victory points are given for economic symbols and fortresses owned at the end of the game. Each hex containing an economic symbol counts as one victory point. Each fortress counts as three, as three victory points. Starport Ermos counts as 10 victory points. A hex or fortress belongs to whatever counter or counters are in it at the end of the game. No counters are in the hex. It belongs to the house with the same colors as the hex. It's the original owner. Set up, I'll show in detail. Sequence of play, the turn phases. Rebel, pl rebel player moves, rebel player combat, including leader combat, Terran player moves, Terran player combat, including leader combat, rebel player replaces troops and recruits galactic heroes, Terran player replaces troops and recruits galactic heroes, Rebel player chooses ally for the remaining neutral houses. Terran player chooses ally for the remaining neutral houses. And then repeat. Movement. No more than three counters may be placed stacked in the same hex. The only exceptions are for the four artifact counters with no movement or combat factors. These counters must always be stacked with another counter and will move at the rate of the counter they are pl placed with. All leader counters include personal troops and you count for stacking. Counters of different colors may stack together if they are controlled by the same player. Counters in the same hex may move together at the rate of the slowest counter, exception, hovercraft, or may move separately as desired. Movement during each player's movement phase, the player may move some, all or none of the counters. So the counters indicate the movement factor. Moving counter into hex costs one movement factor. This additional cost of one movement factor for moving into any rough terrain hexes, which are mountain, desert, or jungle during a turn. So the additional penalty is only applied once per turn, no matter how many different types of hexes of rough terrain are moved through. Counters can, cannot move into or through hex containing enemy counters. Counters may move through hexes containing stacks of friendly counters as long as no more than three counters plus special artifacts, and they move in the same hex. A counter may Use only part of its movement factor if desired. All sea hexes, faction leaders, most galactic heroes, infantry, tank, and artillery counters may not move or attack across all sea hex sides unless transported by Hoovercraft. The map edges, the map represents globe. Thus, counters can move off the east or west side of the map. So, off here to here. So. Directly the opposite edge. The hexes on the eastern and western map edges. Numbered, top of that. So actually this is a, a turn counter, but then also you can use that to map where the hexes go. So. Counters may not move off the north or south map edges. Combat, normal combat. The moving player may attack enemy counters by moving next to them and saying that he or she is attacking. The attacker may look at any of the defender's counters, except our artifacts, before attacking. If desired, 
Moving player may choose not to attack. The moving player can attack an enemy from several different hexes at once, or as long as you, all attacking counters are next to the attacked counters. All defending counters in a stack must must be attacked at one time. No counter can attack or defend more than once in each combat phase. Note that normal combat may be affected in various ways by artifact counters, by psychic powers of house leaders. In addition, leader counters will add their printed combat vectors to their side in normal combat. To fight a combat, the attacker says whether any artifacts or special leader powers will be used, then the def defender decides this also. Attacker and defender each add up how many combat factors they have in combat, then each rolls a die and adds the number rolled to their total. Side with the highest number wins. The loser is take off some counters, so that the total number of combat factors taken off is equal to the difference between the final numbers. This may mean the loser must take off more combat factors than the actual difference. If combat factors exactly equal to the distant difference cannot be removed, the loser must remove more combat factors than the difference. The loser chooses which counters are to be lost. Faction leader counters and collective hero counters must be chosen last. Note that such leaders have a special die roll if they lose, and that leader will still have leader combat even if they lose in normal combat. If all enemy counters and hacks are taken off, including leaders who retreat, the winner may move in up to three attacking counters if he or she wants to. Airjet attacks. Airjet counters may make one attack in any hex they pass over during movement. The attack is declared during movement, but fought at the same time as normal combat. The airjet counters can attack alone or add their combat factors to a normal attack. Airjet counters may be taken off, just like other types of counters, if the owning, owning player loses. Fortresses. Each house fortress, also Starport Ermos, has defensive force shields. All counters defending in the fortress have their combat factors doubled. For example, a 3 5 jump troop in fortress defends with a combat factor of 6 and attacks with a combat factor of 3. Neutral houses. Counters belonging to neutral houses may not be attacked until the house allies with the player. Leader combat. Leader combat. Leader combat. In addition to normal combat, combat will also take place between leaders, faction leaders, and galactic heroes. If both the attacker and defender have leader covered in combat, the leaders must fight a special combat in addition to the normal combat already decided. All leaders are considered to be equal for leader combat purposes. Any special powers the leader possesses apply to normal combat, but not to leader combat. Leader combat is exactly the same as normal combat, except all leaders, except Corvos, are equal. The player who rolls the highest die roll wins. A tie means that neither leader wins or loses. Leader combat is fought until one side has no more leaders in combat, or until all leaders in combat have fought once. A leader who is outnumbered by enemy leaders may have to fight several times until he or she loses or manages to beat all enemy leaders. Note that a player may lose in normal troop combat, but still win the leader combat. Defeated leaders. Defeated leaders are not simply taken from the play like other counters. For each defeated leader, the owning player rolls a die. Roll 1 2 means the leader has been killed and is removed from the board. Cannot be replaced. Row of three to four means the leader is wounded. Move the leader from the board. He or she may enter play at no cost after three turns have been completed. This leader wounded in turn four would re enter turn seven in the replacement recruitment phase. Row of five to six means that the leader was forced to retreat. Move the leader counter to the nearest hex of a friendly color that is unoccupied by any other counters. The leader may not move or attack for one turn. That may defend against attacks. Replacement and re recruitment. Replacements, normal troop counters lost through combat may be replaced in the replacement recruitment phase at a cost of one replacement point per counter. The number of replacement points that each house has during the game is marked on the map in the box next to the house fortress. The Terran player begins the game with 10 replacement points. Repla re replacements enter the game during the replacement recruitment phase of the turn. House replacements must enter on the house fortress hex. Or any house economic hex. Terran replacements enter the starport Ermos or in any brown hex. Replacements must obey the stacking rules when placed on the map. Replacements points are added up. For example, player who begins the game as Imperial Terra and then makes an alliance with the house variant would then have a total of 14 replacement points, 10 plus 4, which could be spent to place any Terran, native, or house 
and some troop counters. When the leader counters may re-enter play at no cost of three turns have passed. Dead leader and destroyed artifact counters may never be replaced. Recruitment. Galactic heroes may recruit by both players during the replacement recruitment phase of each player. The player should roll a die for each house under his or her control. Count the Imperial Terror as a house for these purposes. Roll of one means a hero has been recruited. Heroes are chosen at random from the face down hero pile. If all available heroes have been recruited, no other hero recruitment is possible. Heroes do not cost any replacement points to recruit and may be placed on any friendly fortress or economic hex. Terran reinforcements, Imperial reinforcements. The Terran player. The Terran player receives more troop counters from off-planet one time during the game. These reinforcements consist of two 5-3 power infantry corps, core, two 3-5 jump troops, one 7-4 laser tank battalion, and one 4-10 air jet squadron. These reinforcements do not cost any replacement points when they arrive. To determine when they enter play, the Terran player should roll a die during the placement recruitment phase, beginning on second turn. If one or two is rolled, the uh, Reinforcements arrive on turn 2. If they didn't arrive on turn 2, they arrive on turn 3 if a 1 or 4 is rolled. They'll automatically enter on turn 4 if they have not arrived before then. They can they can be replaced normally if lost in combat. Native troops. The Terran player receives all the native counters, the dark brown counters, plus the leader Muros, as reinforcements on turn 3. The native troops enter during the Terran replacement phase and may be placed on any brown hex. They do not cost any replacement points when they arrive. They can be replaced normally if lost in combat. Alliances. Choosing allies. Each turn during the alliance phase, two houses that begin the game as neutrals will join one side or the other. First rebel player and the Terran player may choose one neutral house as an ally. All counters belonging to the house to that house will come under the control of the player who chooses it. Thus, all houses will be on one side or the other by the end of turn three. And I'll talk about the initial alliances when I do set up. So that's it for the basic game. And then we'll do look at scenario two, the Slock Invasion. All the counters are used. One player is the Slock Invader. The other player is the Terran. The Terran player places counters of the seven houses following the basic game rules. The starting Terran counters are placed wherever the Terran player wishes. Galactic hero counters are separated into two face down piles. One contains Dr. Death, Skarn 3, and Corvus Dromna. Corvus Dromna. The other pile contains the remaining heroes. The two players decide who controls each of the houses before the first turn begins. The soccer player chooses an allied house first, then the Terran chooses an allied house. The players alternate choices until all houses are chosen. The soccer player places the Slucko counters anywhere in the map, except all CXs and place the native troop counters plus Moros anywhere in the brown hexes. The select of player can then move all counters under his or her control. Select of natives and friendly houses. The Terran player can move all Terran counters and all friendly house counters. The select of player moves first. The select have 12 replacement points plus the of all allied houses. The Terrans have 12, 10 replacement points plus those of all allied houses. Select replacements arrive at any friendly economic hex. The only heroes for select of for the Slaka player can recruit are Skarn 3, Duck Death, and Corvus Dromna. Except for the natives, the Terran player receives reinforcements and replacements normally. The Terran player may not recruit Skarn 3, Duck Death, and Corvus and Dromna. No alliance phase is necessary since all allies are chosen before turn 1. The game lengths 10 turn. The winner is the player with the most victory points at the end of the game. And then last scenario, scenario 3, Power of Politics and Morals. Scenarios for two, three, or four players. Each player plays one or more houses, fighting against the other houses for control of the Antares. The player should roll for the first choice, highest roll choose first, then alternate choosing friendly houses until all the houses have been divided among the players as evenly as possible. Leftover houses should be diced for. Setup is done as base game, territory, Terran territory is considered permanently new, neutral. However, counters can move through Terran hexes freely, except that no counters may move through or over the starport Ermoros, even jump troops or air jets. The native counters are not used, nor are the wards from Tain or Omega and the Invincible leader counters. The Slaka and Terra counters should be placed based on a pile of map. They represent off planet mercenaries that are divided evenly among players, just as were the houses. Each player alternately draws a counter from the pile. Leftover counters should be diced for. 
mercenaries are placed on the map like house counters. They are replaced, determined at the beginning of each turn by rolling a die. Players begin the game with zero replacement points. Eliminated mercenary troops are placed on face down in a common dead pile, while eliminated house counters are kept in separate piles. Collected heroes are recruited as in the base game. There is no alliance phase necessary in this scenario. At the end of turn 3, each player should return how many fortresses and economic hexes he or she controls. Each player gains one replacement point, point for each economic hex controlled and three replacement for each fortress controlled. These replacement points may be used to replace destroyed counters in normal fashion during player's replacement recruitment phase each turn. These are the only replacement points given to the player during the game. A four player game, the player started with the only one house receives double the usual number of replacement points. The only restriction on replacements is that all house counters must be replaced before any mercenaries can be replaced. Mercenaries cost twice as much to replace as house counters, and only one mercenary counter may be replaced per turn per player. Mercenary replacements are drawn at random from the face down mercenary troop dead pile. If there are no mercenaries in the dead pile, none may be recruited. The length of the game is eight turns. At the end of the game, the player with the most victory points is the winner. Active diplomacy on the part of the players is encouraged when more than two are playing. And then the credits to um, all of the designer. Then we'll get into setup and play. So I'll go into setup here, which is showing the rules. So the rebel is allowed to choose one main house and then one allied house. And then the Terran chooses one allied house in addition to his Terran forces as well. For the rebels, I'll be going, the main one will be House Kun Kunrabi here. That I'll be going with. And then the allied house will be yellow, the House Edison here. The Terrans will go with the the red, the House Fitzgerald, for their allies. First of all, you, you flip over all the artifact markers and you move them around so you don't know. They're randomized. And similarly, for the Galactic Heroes, you flip them over and randomize them and they show them here. And then for each, on each fortress of the houses, you put an artifact, so those are on each of the each of the fortresses for the seven houses as an artifact, and then on the top of that you put the leader of the house and the unit with the highest combat factor. So in most cases that's laser tanks. In one case I believe it's a power infantry, but that's how we those are stacked up. And then the remainder of the neutral forces, you put them on a force, the other forces on economic, you know, re resource areas. So that's how the neutral one's set up. The rebel player then puts the counters of the two houses. They, they, you set them up in the house of the the color. You set, and then you randomly choose one of the galactic heroes. And I got the Iron General. And I, uh, so I, for setting up my house and the Allied House, I used the same approach where I put the leader and the most powerful unit on the fortress with the artifact, and then put the other ones on resource units. The Terran player then. His starting forces are a 3-5 jump troop, a 7-4 laser tank battalion, and 1-4-10 air jet squadron, 1-2-8 hovercraft, and the 6-3 ward serpentine leader. Well, I put, I put the serpentine leader in air jet in one of the more powerful units on the, on the spaceport. And then I put the other ones in the, the brown, which is you know, the location of the Terran forces. And then I'll, for the turn marker, since I, the aliens aren't being used, I'll use their marker for the turn track. And then we'll get into play. So getting into play here, we'll start with the first turn. 
First phase is the rebel player moves, and again, the rebel, which is Kinrabe, House Kinrabe, and the Yellow House, which is House Ediston. And they're opposing the Terrans and also House Fitzgerald. So they'll move up here. Power Infantry has a movement factor of 3. And it costs 1 plus 1 to go over rough terrain. So it's 2 and then 3. He'll move up as well. He's got 3, so... And you only use the, the, the plus 1 effect on train 1, so... Then over here, he's going to go against the House Fitzgerald up there. Move one. The Iron General, he could take a Hoovercraft, which has a movement factor of eight, but he, he can get there because um, he goes one, two, three, four, and then he's in position for battle there. And I'll put the the leader on the Hoovercraft, and as far as his artifact, it's a field generator, and leave the laser tank at the fortress. And then combat, so you take the combat factor plus the die roll and you compare the two. They're both power infantry, so it's plus four for each of them. So yellow is three plus four, then House Fitzgerald rolls. They get a four. So House Fitzgerald wins. And the difference between the two is one. Because uh, three plus four is seven, four plus four is eight. So yellow has to take off at least one combat factor, and they can't. Um, so they have to take off a whole unit because they can't. They don't have any unit less than that. Another combat up here then, so we have the Iron General with a attack factor of 7 and a jump troop with a attack factor of 3, so 10 versus the 4. So there's a, uh, a 6 difference already, so there's no way you can win, um, so, you know, 13-8. So they, they lose. The difference is five. The only reason you roll in that case is to see what the, the difference is to how many units they take off. So that unit. Then it turns out the the alien artifact that this house has in their fortress is the UFO, which functions as an air jet with a combat factor of five and movement of ten. So they're gonna go and make an attack. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They land on this unit, which has a combat of four. So it's five versus four. So first we'll go with the the UFO. Six. So they've already won. Um, so that's eleven total against one plus four. So eleven minus five is six. So the House Fitzgerald unit is destroyed. And then movement of the Terran forces. So they're going to go in these House Fitzgerald resources. It's got a movement of five so we can get there. It's got a movement of eight here. Can go there. So there are a couple of resources there that are you know, Red House Fitzgerald resources. And they're going to kind of stay up there, but they're going to combat the UFO. So Lord Fitzgerald and the laser tank. Laser tank, and let's see, let's see what alien artifact they have. They have a Devastator, which they won't use right now, but that's good to know. So they're not going to move anymore, but they'll they'll do the combat there. So it's 6 plus 6, so 12 versus a 5. So they're going to be successful. 
15, uh, 11. So, but they have to move, remove their whole unit because they don't have like lower increments than that. So the UFO is gone. So that's the completion of their combat. And then the rebel player. So then they do replacement heroes. The amount of units that you can replace are dictated by the replacement points by the house. So um, four for this fortress, four for this. So they have eight total. And they only have one unit they need to replace, and so they'll put him back in. So they've replaced a power infantry, and they'll recruit a galactic hero. They can roll once for each house they control, and they have two houses. And if they roll one, they get a galactic hero. No? So they get one galactic hero. Draw that randomly from here. And it's Skarm 3. So they have a Galactic Hero. And Skarm 3, the hero of the guy, will be placed on this friendly uh, economic hex. So they don't check for reinforcements yet. They start that on the second turn. So for replacement units, the Terran gets 10. And then for an additional house, so Fitzgerald has 4. So they have a total of 14 replacements. So I can get back the power infantry. They can actually get back two power infantries. So since those replacements are for an allied house, they, they put them on either an economic hex or fortress, so they enter there and there. And then they do galactic recruitment. So Terra is counted as a house, so they can roll twice. One. So they get in two. So they get one galactic hero. And they get Dr. Death, which they'll put, put here, because that's House Fitzgerald. And then the Rebel player chooses an ally. So the Rebel will choose, they'll choose House Orsini, which is purple, which is a good match for them, because they're by their other setting. And let's see what uh, what artifact they have. They have a force cannon. And then the Terran player will choose... They'll choose House McKenzie because that's also handy for them because that's where they're located as well. Then we'll see what artifact they have. And they have a Sonic Imploder. Then we'll move to the next turn. So Chapman had a couple turns here now. So Google's going to take a Hoovercraft and uh, do some leader-to-leader -leader combat against Khyber Khan. So the Rebel has moved and combated, and now the Terran is moving and combating. So we're going against a stack here of Kuber Khan and a power infantry. So that's five plus four nine. Dougal has a it's Dougal and then which is five and a laser tank is six. So eleven. So they have some advantage. And then let's see. So these special psychic abilities of the leaders come into play here. Our first we'll see what Dougal and Kubra Khan can do. Dougal McKenzie has teleportation power. He can teleport any of McKenzie counters to any chosen hex each turn during his movement. So he's going to take advantage of that and move a power infantry and do his hex to get their bonus. Kubr Khan, I'm sorry, Nurab Khan, has precognition. When his stack is in combat, he rolls twice, two dice instead of one. And then after that, they'll do leader combat as well. 
So this should be interesting. So since he teleported over, he's got 4 plus 5 plus 6, so 9. So he's got 15 versus 5, 9. So 15 versus 9, which is a plus 6. So yellow is going to lose, but it's by how much, and they can roll twice. So first for the, the blue, 2. So 17, and he gets to roll twice. So he's got 9 plus 5. He'll roll again. So his best roll is at 9 with a 5. So it's... 17 versus 14 so they lost and they lose three and the you lose the leader last so they lose the power infantry so that was the combat segment and then it's the leader combat and this is Straight up, you, you roll a dice, and whoever gets the highest number wins the leader combat. So Dougal, three, con, six. So he wins. And then we see what happens to Dougal, who lost. So we roll the dice. So on a one to two, the leader's been killed. He has removed from the board, cannot be replaced. If it's three to four, it's wounded. Five to six, he retreats. But we got a two. He's killed. He's removed from play. And then again, so after the, you know, the rubble player moves, rubble player combat, terror player moves, terror player combat, which we just did. Then the rubble player replaces troops and recruits galactic heroes. Terran player replaces troops, recruits. Rebel choose ally, turn choose ally. Then they continue the play. So that's Revolt on Antares. A little bit there to show how it's played and hopefully give you a sense of what's involved. 1981 from TSR. It's a lot, it is a small package, but it's got a lot going on in that small package. It's sci-fi with a little bit of fantasy thrown in. You got psychic powers, you have, you effectively have production because you're replacing units based on your kind of resource points. It's asymmetrical in that the size of different you know, numbers of kind of types of counters and you have different heroes you can come in. Three you know fairly different scenarios and a lot of variations within each of those. Um, definitely a unique game. Combat is very simple. You just roll dice and add factors and there's not combat results table but it actually works. Um, I wish the leader combat was a little more complicated because you just roll see as highest and then see what happens. But still it's got a lot going on in the game and if you can get a copy I'd recommend it. It's very unique. For its uniqueness I think it'll give it a an 8 out of 10. Thanks a lot.